This week, tens of thousands of Every Nation people from around the world gathered together in thousands of prayer meetings in hundreds of cities to fast, pray, and study God's amazing, abundant, justifying, inviting, sanctifying, enriching, sufficient, and overcoming grace. With 12 translations, including Spanish, Thai, Vietnamese, Mandarin, Japanese, and others, our guide led us through the many facets of this gift of grace. In our seven devotional videos, we heard from every nation leaders from Fiji, from Poland, the US, India, Canada, South Africa, and the Philippines. This week, we did much more than miss a few meals. There's a reason we call this our annual week of prayer, fasting, and consecration. Yes, we prayed together, and we fasted together, but perhaps more importantly, we consecrated ourselves to God and to His purpose. Your consecration this week will impact all 52 weeks in 2020 and beyond. As we continue to build on this year's theme, I hope it results in a deeper experience of God's amazing and transforming grace in your life, in your family, in your church, in your city, in your nation. Thank you for joining your Every Nation family around the world in this year's Prayer, Fasting, and Consecration Week. Wow. Y'all look amazing. All 10,000 of you. Wow, that is, that is awesome. And, and yeah, I see you way up there. This, this open air arena is just gorgeous. The, the, the weather is beautiful. Even the, there's these apple trees over here. If y'all guys over here, ladies, if y'all just get hungry, just pull that apple off and you can start eating this morning. Oh, nice little orange grove running over here. That's wonderful. And the sound system, wow. The sound system blew my mind. Uh, just the drums, whoo, just rattled my chest this morning. And uh, Yeah? Oh, hey, Robert. How you doing? Oh, you are looking mighty muscular today, Robert. Uh, I'll, thank you. I'll take that note. Ooh, that's weird. Okay, let's just read this note that Pastor Robert gave me. Pastor Brent, just wanted you to know that during the offering this morning, we took up enough money to pay off the entire mortgage payment for our new building. What? Wow. Thank you. And Bill, Bill, Bill Gates is here? Oh, good, Bill. Yes, over there. Thank you for that generous contribution. That is wonderful. And oh, it's just y'all. <laughs> so, and it's just me. Well, I uh, wanted to do that this morning because I think that uh, I had this planned a long time ago, like earlier this week before we had all this, and it just means so much more now in light of our technical situation that we've been in. Um, but. I want to use that this morning to set up a little bit of an analogy, if you will, between God's grace. Just a, a topic today that we've been talking about, we've been praying about this week, we'll be into for the next few weeks here, God's grace to give us some clarity, maybe use that as an illustration of God's amazing grace. Particularly today we're going to talk about his justifying grace. But before I get into that, I just want to mention a couple of things real quickly. First of all, uh, this week we spent some time with some staff development with a good friend of ours in this ministry uh, who came up from Tallahassee. He's an elder at Pastor Adrian's church at our Every Nation Church, Engaged Church, Tallahassee. Many of you know Pastor Adrian. He's preached here before. He's been here for our campus conference. He's been here for our arena before. And uh, Dr. Mike Zoda is one of his elders there, also in uh, family counseling and therapy. And he has uh, been doing that for 31 plus years. So he was up here this week. We planned this months ago that he would work with our staff this week. And it has been a phenomenal time with him. So Dr. Mike Zoda is here. If you would just welcome him uh, from in focus. He knows all about us and he loves this church. 
Uh, so that's good news. He spent a lot of time with almost all of our staff, some spouses, and just an amazing time of God's grace really in our life. I believe God's perfect timing that he was here this week as well. And then secondly, I'm excited. I mentioned to you last week that I had some really exciting news that I was going to wait to share with you this Sunday. And I'm excited to be able to do that this morning. So uh, we are, will be hiring an executive director who will be starting on the 1st of February here with us at In Focus Church. And many of you know him. It is Joshua Maxwell. And this is Josh and his family. As I said before, Josh and his sorority. So he is the house dad. Um, but we are so super excited about Josh. He's, he and his family, Angelica, his wife, their kids have been here for many, many years, served in many capacities. He also runs our production, leads our production team here, which was uh, doing a lot of work since early this morning. Uh, we will get a lot of that figured out over the next 24 to 48 hours, hopefully. Uh, but I appreciate all of them, Scott, Kyle, uh, CJ, all those who were here earlier, Caleb, and all the worship team that was here that didn't actually get to participate, uh, all of them doing up. They, they had a portable, like, summer camp set up in the first service because we didn't have no sound. So it was, it was awesome. It was like we were at summer camp, except it was January and inside a building. So it wasn't quite like that, but somewhat like that. Uh, but all of that to say, we're excited about him being a part of our staff He's always been a part of this spiritual family for a long time, but it will be great to be able to work alongside him. So now, let's move into this morning's message. Uh, I want to just mention about the AR, VR thing that I was talking about. For those of you who don't know, maybe you're not very tech savvy, AR just means really augmented reality. VR means virtual reality. Uh, basically, an AR would let a user experience the real world but then digitally augment or enhance it in some way. So uh, it's, it's being used a lot now in marketing and things like that. So you've got AR, then you've got VR, which is virtual reality. On the other hand, it removes the user from the real world experience altogether and replaces it with a completely simulated one. That's kind of what those VR goggles were. That's why I said y'all looked so good through those. And, um, and I looked amazing too. My arms were just bulging when I looked over there. That's what it looked like. I want to share with you a little story. This past summer, uh, we were in uh, Orlando for the Every Nation World Conference, which is just a phenomenal time. I know many of you got to go as well. Uh, but we took one afternoon, myself, Pastor Adrian from our Every Nation Church in Tallahassee, Pastor Andy King, which some of you know from our Every Nation Church in Marietta, Atlanta, and then his son, uh, I think he's about 10 years old, Graham. Uh, my son was there, Josiah. Uh, a few other people from the church were there. And we went down to Disney Springs, the void at Disney Springs. Anybody ever been to the void at Disney Springs? One person. Okay. What do you people do? Like, I see your Instagrams. Half of you are at Orlando more than you're here. No, it may not be that bad. So maybe you've just never been to the void at Disney Springs. All right. The void at Disney Springs has this experience. VR experience, and this particular one that we went to was called Star Wars Secrets of the Empire. Now, uh, we put on the goggles just like that. We had vests, we had guns, and when we put on the goggles, immediately we all look like stormtroopers. Like I'm looking over at Josiah, and he's this tall stormtrooper, and I'm looking over at Graham, which is Andy's son, who's about this tall, and he's like a, a mini stormtrooper. I was like, Oh, that's cute. You're not going to be able to help us at all. So, um, but anyway, so we all are like stormtroopers, and I don't want to spoil it for you, but I am going to spoil it for you because you guys don't do anything it doesn't sound like, and so you don't have to worry about it. You're never going there. But if you go in and you go through this whole thing, I'm like going through the lava fields, and it's like it's hot, and I'm like, I really feel like I'm in a volcano right now. And then you're shooting things and all these monsters, and you get to the end, and Darth Vader shows up. Now, it, it's pretty freaky. Like, it's, it's real. And, and I'm like, I mean, I'm my blaster. I'm just like unloading on Darth Vader. And so Matt Bricado's over there, and he's like a big, you know, he's a, he's a big stormtrooper. And he's unloading. And we're just like, nothing's changing. He's just like coming towards us. He's not stopping. I'm like, shoot him, shoot him. We're just going into it. And then I look over to my right, and I see this stormtrooper over here in the corner like this. And your first inclination is, oh, Graham is freaking out. Like he's 10, he's about to die over there. It was Andy, his dad. I'm like, King, what are you doing? He's like, I'm making myself small. <laughs> like it doesn't matter if he gets over here, he's going to impale you with his lightsaber. Get up and shoot the guy. So we did 
get him, but I think we had some help from another Jedi that showed up or something like that. I don't remember completely. Uh, but the reality was, once we took the goggles off, of the thing, you know, the problem with AR and VR, once you take the goggles off, because this is just kind of our newfound iteration of escapism here in our world, you realize that you're still yourself. Like, I'm, I'm not a stormtrooper, and I, I'm still in the world that I was always been in, and nothing's changed, and it's unaugmented, and it's real, and it's just as ugly as it was before I put the goggles on. So... What if there was something, a story, with real world-changing power that could augment both our current reality and change our eternal reality, not just in your perception, but for everyone in truth? And there is a story like that. If you have your Bible with you today, I want you to turn to Titus chapter 3, verse 3 through 7. If you're following along on the YouVersion app, you can find it in the events portion of that app. It'll also be up on the screen as we go through the message throughout this morning. We're going to unpack today God's word, and I want us to look at the implications of God's word and what it means for us today so that we can live according to his word. How many of you know that reading God's word does not actually change you until you begin to apply it by the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, begin to do God's word? We're not just to be those that hear God's word, we're supposed to be those that do God's word. So as we imply today, as we look at the implications that God is speaking to us through His word, we also now have to apply it to our lives. So let's look at verse 3, starting there. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Verse 6, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. God, we pray that you would bless your word today as we apply it to our lives, changes from the inside out. So this passage starts off in verse three, right? Foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, malice, envy, hating others and being hated by others. It is generally describing what we were all like before we got saved, right? It's not comprehensive, it's not exhaustive list, right? And all my sinners said, oh come on. She should say, I know that's right, because there's some stuff I've done that ain't on that list. There's a lot of things that, 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 that are not here. It's not an exhaustive, comprehensive list. It's just to get a good start or, or a bad start, whichever you want to look at it. It's to get a start on what our lives were like before we met the grace of God. Paul is reminding Titus of this. Remember what your former life was like. Why? Because he knows what we need to know today as we look at this, is that an eye full of what we were like before God's grace helps us see grace more clearly right now. An eye full of what we were like before God's grace invaded our life and changed us helps us to see how we can be empowered to live in God's grace right now. And this is exactly what Paul was doing for Titus. And he goes and he says, here's the list. At one time, you too were foolish which means that you are without spiritual understanding. At one time, you didn't know this. At one time, you didn't understand what Jesus had done. At one time, you were lost without an answer. So just remember that. At one time, you were foolish. Then he goes on to say, next on the list, you were disobedient, which that is directed towards God. What, who are we ultimately, you said this last week, who are we ultimately sinning against? Who are we ultimately disobeying when we don't live according to God's word? Yes, we hurt other people, but ultimately we are disobeying our creator, the one who has given us life. So that is disobedient. You didn't listen to God. And then he goes on to say, so therefore you were deceived. The Greek word for deceived suggests a false guide leading us astray. So we disobey God, and then guess what happens? We get deceived. If you're going to disobey God, I can assure you of one thing. You will begin to walk in deception. You will be led astray by a false guide. Not a false, not the real God, but a false God and a false guide. Then he goes on to say, 
Paul gives a metaphor, if you will, of slavery to illustrate your former bondage, he said, to passions and pleasures. You were once in slavery to these things. Again, as one commentator says, only the freed man can appreciate to the full the abjectness of his former state of slavery. Said another way, maybe a little bit easier is, once you have been in slavery, you realize when you've been set free how much you've been set free from. And that's what he's saying. If you will remember your former way of life, when you were in bondage to all these things, if you remember what your life used to be like, then you can walk in the power of God's grace today because he has the power to get you through whatever you're going through. And this is the power that we see. Then he goes on and says, the words, we lived in malice and envy. What is that doing? It's reflecting essentially our antisocial nature of our former life. We weren't nice people. In our, in our heart, it says that our desire, basically what it's saying is you are, he's emphasizing you had a desire to do evil, malice and envy. And as you go through the Old Testament again and again, you'll see things like God saying they didn't even think a good thought. They couldn't even think a good thought. Everything they thought about was evil. And this is where we lead or led to when we live apart from Christ and his grace. Then it goes on saying how easily this culminates with being hated and hating showing us how very simple it is to find ourselves treating one another this way and being treated this way when we are not living according to God and his word. So if you're a Christian in here this morning, here's what I want you to do. I want you to think back on what your life was like before the grace of God invaded you, invaded your heart, invaded your mind, invaded your life, before Christ saved you. This is another way to remember correctly what God has done, the grace of God in your life. Because look, it can be discouraging. I'm with you. It can be discouraging to be a Christian and continue to fail at things that you hope that you would overcome. Why can't I get through this? Man, I've got bills to pay. I've got this relationship to work on. I've got this thing to do. Man, this mountain seems so big. I don't think I'm ever going to grow. I don't think I'm ever going to change. Maybe you've got some sort of addiction that you're dealing with. Maybe you've got some sort of dysfunction that's surrounding you. It's like, this is never going to change. I don't know how I'm going to get through this. I don't know if God's grace is sufficient for this. And here's what Paul is trying to remind us. And here's what I think God wants you to understand today. Because honesty compels us to, to admit that it's difficult to get through this life, a life in a world that is enslaved, if you will, by sin. But here's what you need to know. God's already saved you from more than what is in front of you. Hello? God has already saved you from more than what's in front of you. I don't care what's in front of you. What has he saved you from? Death. So no matter what you may face in this life, if he has brought you from death to life, if he has freed you from the power of sin over your life, he has what? He has saved you from more than what's in front of you right now. And you can trust that the same grace that saved you is the same grace that will sustain you, and it's the same grace that will get you through whatever you may be facing today. It's the grace of God. Now, if you're here today and... This is how God's grace augments your life in Christ. This is, this is an a, a, a augmented reality, but it's a real one in Christ. If you're here today and you say, well, listen, I, I'm not a Christian, and, and I'm just kind of here, I'm visiting, or, or I'm with a friend, and I'm not really sure about all of this Jesus stuff, and I'm not really sure about all of this, if this is for me, here's what you might be thinking. You think, wow, I'm looking at this list. These, this is what these Christians think about us. They think we're some jacked up people. But first of all, let me just tell you that we're all jacked up people that all need the grace of God. And here's the other thing that I want you to understand, because scripture teaches us a different way to look at everyone. In fact, the Bible story, the gospel story, gives us more reason to respect all people and treat them with dignity and deference than any other story out there, and here's why. Because Genesis 1 says that we were all made in the image of God. And so we are to image, if you will, image God wherever we go and whoever we might be with so that we can give respect and deference to those who are made in the image of God, even if they're not following God, because we want them to be a part of God's family. We would love them and extend the same grace to them that has been extended to us by God. Not something that they earned, just like we didn't earn it, 
but because we have been changed by the power of God's grace. And so here's the other thing that I want you to understand. If you are in here today and you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, here's what you need to understand. That list doesn't make you a sinner. The list of things that you have done doesn't make you a sinner. The Bible says in Romans that we are all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we sin because we are sinners. That's what happens. It's a result of the fall of man because of Adam and Eve's disobedience, and now corruption is still at work today around us, and that's why grace is so amazing. Let's move on to verse four. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared. See, there's the contrast. What? Verse three of what we used to be, and now it's connected by one of the biggest buts in the Bible. I never get tired of saying that. Somebody said, did he know he just said big butt? Yes, it's the biggest butt in there. This is what happens. You have all of this stuff. This is what you used to be like. And then there is that conjunction. But the grace of God. But the power of God. But God comes in and he changes our reality. And here's where we see it. He says, God's amazing grace is rooted in the appearing of Jesus. His generosity towards humankind for our benefit is seen in our Savior. This is Paul's shorthand for the gospel. He's saying this is the story of Jesus coming to save those who needed to be saved. And the purpose of the manifestation of God's kindness and love was to bring salvation to his people. Therefore, God is referred to as our Savior. Right here in this passage, God is a saving God first and foremost. He has come to save, and the act of saving is in the life, death, resurrection of his son Jesus, and it is absolutely amazing. And when we know him as our Savior and Lord, he alters who we are immediately, and he separates us from our past, and he gives us a new future, and he gives us a new destiny. He doesn't just alter our immediate present, he alters our future destiny by his grace. Verse 5. He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. Who saved us? Not me. Not you. He saved us. People cannot save themselves. Oh, but we're going to try. But we do not save ourselves. That's why the scripture says all the way back in Psalm 68, 20, our God is a God who saves. He is a saving God. He is God, our Savior. So repentance and faith, which is what is needed in order to be saved, is enabled. It's enabled response to God's grace by God's grace. And we realize this so that we don't become prideful. It's nothing that I did to make this a reality. This is Christ alone. Knowing God is not just a God who saves. That's, oh, well he is a God who saves. No, he is a God who saved you. And if he saved you, he changed your life and he changed everything about what you do in this life. It is an augmented reality. I just heard like this loud pitch, like my hearing aid went off or something. And I don't have one, but yet. Um, So just, you guys okay back there? Verse 5, continuing, he saved you not because of works done by us in righteousness. See, here's where we have to be clear. Because Christianity is not a call for you to augment your own reality. Christianity is not a call for you to augment your own reality. That's religious self-deception. That's a treadmill of performance. It's easy to get on. I think we've all been there. I think we've all tried. If I could do this a little more, if I could do this right, if I could just get there to church, if I could just get in that group, if I could just do this thing, then God would do this. And here's the reality. That's not how we respond to God in this life. The problem with treadmill performance and that type of religion is that it either leads to pride or it leads to despair. Bear. Here's the reality. So if I do that in my mind, and I begin to think, well, if I just do, if I keep the rules of my religious code or my moral code, then I become arrogant because I did it. Conversely, if I don't keep the rules of my religious code or my moral code, then I fall into despair because I just couldn't do it, couldn't measure up. But here's where justifying grace is so powerful. Justifying grace gives us full assurance that God won't love us any more if we perform well, and he won't love us any less if we perform poorly. That's grace. 
As I said already, it's unmerited. Pastor Robert said it a moment ago. By justifying grace, here's really a, a definition of it, if you will. It's our acceptance before God. And the grounds for our righteousness are solely Jesus' work of a sinless life, substitutionary death, and bodily resurrection, and therefore are not in any way contingent upon what we do or what we do not do. It is completely contingent upon what Christ has already done on the cross. This is grace. So I guess we won't have anything to do. No, 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 no. Will we do good works? Absolutely. That's why Paul said in Ephesians 2.10 that God has prepared in advance good works for you to do. But here's what we need to understand. Before you ever decided or wanted to do good works, God had them for you to do. However, good works are a result, not the cause, of the saving, transforming power of God's grace in your life. They don't cause it. They're a result of it. Powerful quote alert. This comes from Charles Spurgeon, who could have preached to thousands as he did without a sound system. Thank God I don't have to do that. Here's what he said. Works of righteousness are the fruit of salvation, and the root must come before the fruit. You know he's a pastor because he's rhyming, right? The root must come before the fruit. Right, it just sounded good like that. He might have said it that way. I don't know. The Lord saves his people out of clear, unmixed, undiluted mercy and grace, and for no other reason. So Paul goes on to tell us why we are saved. He goes on in this verse, says, but according to his own mercy. Because of God's mercy, salvation depends solely and completely on God's grace, which augments his mercy, and it is displayed in his mercy, revealed and achieved by his son, Jesus Christ, and applied to humankind by the power of the Holy Spirit. God's mercy and his compassion and kindness towards those who are in serious need. That would include me, that would include you, that would inc include all of creation. God's grace augments his mercy towards those who are in need of both and can't do anything to get either and he goes on to say by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the holy spirit regeneration is really just a technical term for being born again or becoming a christian it's the act of god on a spiritually dead human to what bring about a newness of life a resurrection if you will that's why when you go through water baptism the pastor will typically say buried with christ in his death raised to a newness of life there's a regeneration that takes part because of the power of the holy spirit it's an act of god to bring a spiritually dead person not a bad person that needs to be made good no a dead person that needs Needs to be made alive again and it indicates the washing which is an activity of the holy spirit and this washing inv involves rebirth and it involves renewal a new creation that's starting from the inside out and here's what that means for us today and this is such good news it should bring you such joy and comfort you're not just forgiven for what you've done you've been clean from what's been done to you and this is good news that should make all of us, no matter where we've come from or what we've been through, feel incredibly what? Brand new, because that's what's happening. That's the term, right? Being born again, made brand new, rebirth, renewal. I'm being forgiven for what I've done, and I'm being clean from what's been done to me. On a macro spiritual level, that's amazing because God is, is seeing me through Christ's righteousness. And even from a, a micro practical level, no matter what anybody may have done to you in this life that you think you can't get past or that you can't think, think that you can't get through, God's grace is more than sufficient for that and he will make you new. Man, if God really does this, if he changes us at the core of our being from the inside out, then this is amazing. We are made right, we're saved, we're washed, and we're given the spirit to be different, not just feel different. And this is very important in a world that puts more emphasis on emotions than maybe we should at times, and they're valid. We've been talking about them here. God gave them to us, but they are not what we worship. We worship God first and foremost. And so the reality is, here's the cool thing, the work of the Holy Spirit because of the grace and mercy of God is so that I would be altogether different from the inside out, and that will actually make me feel much better. 
When I know what God has done, when I know what he's done for me, when I know what he's doing in the lives of those around me, when I know what he's doing in the body of Christ, when I know the hope that I have in him, I don't just feel different, however. I am different in every way and what I say and what I do and how I think and how I act. I don't just feel better. I am made holy through Christ. And of course, yeah, at the end of the day, I'm going to feel a lot better because of that says, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. The descriptive term richly, some translations say generously, that's what it means. And here's what it proposes, that God's pouring out of the Holy Spirit is totally sufficient for the needs of every believer. So I just, well, what you got? Well, I got this, and, and this went on in my life, and this went, I, I went, good, God's grace is more than enough for that. What, well, pastor, you wouldn't understand this thing that I've been through. No, you're right. I might not understand, but God's grace is sufficient for that. He poured it out richly. He poured it out generously. It is more than enough. It's not going to scrape by. It's going to be more than enough. He's going to take care of you and help you and empower you, and there's still going to be grace left over, really. That's how it is. It's, it's pouring over. It's abundant, as we talked about last week. So he's pouring it out richly. You don't think you can be different, but God's grace says otherwise. And this generous outpouring of the Holy Spirit is a direct result, what Paul is saying, of the work of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who came. And then finally, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. I wonder how many of you in this room this morning feel hopeless about a situation, about a job, about a relationship, about your future or because of your past. And here's what I want you to understand. This right here, this particular part of this passage truly expresses the goal, purpose, or result of our salvation so that what? We might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. However, we don't get to become heirs unless we are first justified by his grace. We don't get the inheritance without accepting the one who gives it, and it is Jesus Christ. So in Christ, in believing and receiving the work of Christ on the cross for my benefit to be saved by his power, by grace through faith, I am then justified. And here's what justifying grace means. It permits us, though legally condemned as sinners, to stand before our holy and righteous God and be justly declared righteous as sinners saved by the death and resurrection of the sinless Jesus in our place for our sins. Justified. By grace. Not because of what I did, but because of what Christ has done. Now, because of this, you can be an heir. What does that mean? It means it's not, you're not just in the family, you're in the will. Right, you're going to inherit, he says, the universe forever. Because you're in relationship with God by faith in Christ, you've been signed up to receive his inheritance. All of the promises of God are yes and amen. God doesn't justify you merely to justify you. He justifies us, washes us, and does all that he does to bring us into his family and make us full heirs of his kingdom. And that is to give us hope. This gives us hope which is really called the hope of glory. Many times we say, I just don't have hope. What we're saying is, I don't have a hope for next week. I hope next week is better than last week, or I hope this day is better than that last day. And that is a still, no matter that's good, that's hopeful, but that is temporal, and it's even situational. My situation is gonna change whether I'm hopeful or not. But this hope that Paul is talking about is not based on my situation. It's not based on what's gonna happen next week or the week thereafter. It is anchored in the hope that is based upon an inheritance that will never stop, never fade, never fail because it is of God's justifying grace that I have hope of an eternal life. And nothing can take that away. So I wanna encourage you, church, because, here's, here's this why it's so encouraging. As you study grace, we've been doing this week and we'll do for the next few weeks. These, we are living in the times that the prophets and the people of the Old Testament longed for. Like, they, they wanted this. They were longing for where what? Where in Christ appearing, grace and mercy would be poured out richly and generously upon the church, upon his people. They longed for that. 
And here we are living in those days where Jesus' grace has been poured out richly and generously upon us. And as we seek the Holy Spirit to equip us and to empower us and to enable us, we begin to taste the life to come while accomplishing great things for God's kingdom right now. We're not holding on and hoping that that Christ comes back tomorrow so that I can just get out of here. No, we're empowered by God's grace to do all that he's called us to do right now. God empowers us to walk in the right now in victory while we wait for the not yet that will consummate when he returns. See, that's the power of grace that it keeps us in this waiting period between the now of the finished work of the cross and the not yet of him coming back and appearing again and taking us to be home. And God's grace enables us to walk in the middle. So we all have a choice. Embrace a happy myth to augment our reality. Put on the VR goggles and pursue worldly things to help us out. Another religion, a career, another relationship. Or realize that the only story with the power to change reality is the story of the one who made it a reality. Jesus, who came to pour out his grace and mercy richly and generously. Amazing grace augments our reality. It augments the mercy of God, and it augments our reality to be what God intended us to be in Christ. So, if you're a Christ follower here today, say, yes, Pastor Brent, I I, I love Jesus and I follow him, then I want to encourage you this morning as we sing a, the last song about grace before we walk out, I want you to look back and remember where God has taken you from and where he's brought you to. I promise you, if you'll just, God, just, I want to look back, I want to recall what I was like in my former life, and then I want to recall, remember we said this last week, whatever leads to worship and, and, and the sense of God's goodness, not to what leads to shame or condemnation, don't go there, but recall what Christ has done for you, recall your salvation, let the joy of your salvation that scripture talks about flood your soul today, let the reality of what God has done augment your life in this world right now, remember that you're an heir, remember that you're a son, a daughter of the King of Kings, and that you have a hope of glory eternally, the infinite power of your eternal inheritance changes your perspective. God's justifying grace should augment your reality now because it has already changed your destiny in the future. If you're still here trying to figure it out, not so sure, this is all new to you or you just don't believe it's true for you, maybe for you guys, but not for me. Well, AR and VR are fun diversions, nothing necessarily inherently wrong with it. But it does show us something about ourselves, I believe. As does a lot of the things that we're chasing. It shows us that we really want reality to be different and better than it is. I want you to push into that. Why is that? Because I think at the core, if we're all honest, the core of our being, we know that the world we live in should be different and could be different. Better than it is. And the promise of tech and other things in this world is that they'll make it happen. And they might make things a little bit better, but there's only one story, as we've talked about today, with the power to change your now and your forever. And it's the amazing grace of Christ's mercy. That's the story. God's justifying grace, which alters your present and your future forever because God's loving kindness was poured out upon us generously when Christ appeared. I want his grace to wash over you today in a very real way. I want 2020 to be a year of grace for us, church. Walking in it, extending it, receiving it from God and giving it to others. That's the only way that we can be the people that God's called us to be. By his amazing grace. So would you join me in prayer right now as we close in worship?